could Almighty God, the God of wrath, use Joe Biden for good? Could he use Kamala Harris for good? Today's podcast is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Many people in the, I was watching the live chat before I went live and people were saying, Marshall's becoming a socialist, Marshall's pro Joe Biden. You got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. Today I'm going to take you through a journey, a parallel journey of the fourth century in the Roman Empire. And we're going to talk about this man. Julian the Apostate. I've spent the last three days, Joy, my wife, saying, what are you doing over there? What, what are you studying? What are you working on? I said, I'm working on the 4th century. And as I've worked through the 4th century, because I think our current scenario as disciples of Jesus Christ in a church that's becoming more and more leadership, sorry, not the church, church leadership becoming more and more heretical and disobedient, and immoral parallels what happened in the 4th century with the Arian heresy. And a key moment happened in the 4th century, and that was the reign of Julian the Apostate. And what I realized is the reign of Julian the Apostate was, in a way, the best thing that happened to the Orthodox Athanasian Nicene group of theologians and fathers who preach the truth, the true Catholics. I'm going to explain why that is and how it relates, maybe, to Joe Biden. But before we do that, we're going to pray together. So please join me in prayer as we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Mighty God, we ask that you would protect us and preserve us. We ask that you would purify your church and that you would give us the graces needed to persevere in whatever happens. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Joseph. Pray for us, Our Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us, in nomine Patris, et Fidii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, yesterday, the Electoral College elected Joe Biden. Whether it's right, whether it's fair, you already know my thoughts on that. I've been talking about it for an entire month. Today, I want to pivot and talk about what would happen if we lived under a regime that was socialist, communist, pro-abortion, pro-vaccination, anti-privacy, higher taxes, anti-family, anti-small business, and on and on. Perhaps, you know what's trending on Twitter today? tax the churches that's that's trending right now because they're realizing the, the secularists that churches all the way from the archdiocese of los angeles the catholic church do you know the catholic church received 1.4 billion in ppp loans because of covid 1.4 billion dollars that's right people are mad because joe osteen received, I don't know how much it was, a lot of money. I don't know if it was millions or what. They are saying, why is Joel Osteen getting PPP loans from the federal government? So trending on Twitter right now is tax the church. So we're looking at a rough go. And we kind of already knew whether, whether Trump was the president for the next four years, that would have been great. Or whether Joe Biden and Kamala, we knew that that would just speed up what was going to happen anyway. So let's go back in time. Let's get in our time machine and go back to the fourth century, the 300s. What was going on in the 300s? Well, the bloodiest persecution 
the tenth and final persecution of pagan Rome against Catholic Christians was in the year, well, culminating, starting in 299, going on up to 303. I'm going to do a shameless plug here. I wrote a trilogy of books, historical novels. I think you should read them over Christmas. Boom, here they are. The first book is Sword and Serpent, and it, it is a retelling of the day in which the Diocletian persecution began. It's a historical novel about St. George and Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor. In 299, the Emperor Diocletian and the other Caesars were having a divination sacrifice. And there was a Christian servant nearby who made the sign of the cross as they were trying to do divination. And they realized that the gods were silent. They would not speak because the sign of the cross had been made. This sparked the revolution. This is the opening line from my book, Sword and Serpent. Domine, the gods are silent. The words came as a whisper under the breath, as quiet as the end of times is ever proclaimed. That's how it begins in 303. I've done a lot of research on the early 300s because I was writing these novels. 1,453 pages, which is also the year Constantinople was destroyed. This persecution was fierce. Many of the greatest saints of our church, the martyrs, were killed, culminating in 303, even as late as 305. Constantine came, and we all, maybe you don't, but there was a battle, and he saw a sign in the sky. In this sign you shall conquer. He did conquer. It was the sign of the cross. And his first act was to issue an edict making Catholic Christianity legal in the Roman Empire, 313. He himself seems, it's kind of fuzzy, was a, was a follower of Jesus Christ, although there's controversy of his baptism, whether he received baptism in Rome by the Pope, Sylvester, which is the old Roman tradition. It's inscribed in Rome on an obelisk and at the baptistry at the Lateran Basilica? Or was he baptized later by an Arian, Eusebius of Nicomedia, out east? Regardless of what happened, in 325 there was a council. And at the council where there was St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, the real Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, he jack-slapped the heretic named Arius. He didn't B-slap him, he H-slapped him. That's the heretic slap. Because Arius said that Christ, the second person of the Trinity, two lies about the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, that he was created, that there was, technically he said he was gener generated, but that generation was a creation, so that there was a time when the Son of God was not. And also he stated that the Father and the Son were not consubstantial and co-eternal. Arius said these blasphemies in the presence of the bishop. St. Nicholas let him have it and gave him the H slap. Not the B slap, but the H slap. Heretic slap. The council, called by Constantine and attended by the bishops, under the leadership of a man named St. Hoseus of Cordova, ruled and gave the primordial version of the Nicene Creed that Christ is eternal with the Father, and consubstantial with the Father. A young man, Athanasius, was a deacon. He went on to become a patriarch. And for the next, how many decades? Six decades, there were exiles, martyrdoms, tortures over whether the Son of God was co-eternal and consubstantial with the Father. Constantine dies in what is it, 330s, 337? Going off memory here, I might be wrong. And his son, Constantius II, becomes the ruler. Constantius II was an Arian. He believed that Christ was not consubstantial with the Father, not co-eternal. And he began to support the Arian clergy. So much so that by the time you get into the 350s, most of the bishops and the clergy in the church are Arian. 
They deny that Christ is co-eternal and consubstantial with the Father. You realize this is a great blasphemy. It's sacrilege in the church. Jerome, writing of this time, says that the church awoke and groaned to find herself Arian. The church was heretical. Even the Pope, Pope Liberius, who's the first Pope not to be canonized as a saint. He's not a saint. He didn't become an Arian, but he seems to approve of the exile and persecution of St. Athanasius. Now, St. Athanasius is the A-team leader of those saying Christ is co-eternal and consubstantial with the Father. This is not how many angels can dance on the head of the pin. This is the very core of what is Christianity. Is Christ eternally divine and consubstantial with the Father, or is he basically a mega angel, a super angel? That's what the debate is. Now, in 359, that's the height of Arianism. And the good guys, the Orthodox Catholic bishops and priests, have been exiled. They've been kicked out of the empire. They're the bad people. They're the ones who are told, you're not a real Christian. You're in schism with the real church. We have the cathedrals. We have the churches. You guys are using this language of consubstantial. That's not in the Bible. You guys are heretics and you are schismatics. That's what they're saying in the 350s. Athanasius has been exiled four times. Four times. But then the Arian Emperor Constantius II, if you're wondering where the, how this relates to Joe Biden, I'm going to get there. But listen, it's very important. Constantius II dies. I'll give you a little fun fact here on the screen. Constantius II dies. And the new Roman Emperor is Julian. He becomes emperor in 361 and only reigns till 363. This is him right here on the screen. This is Julian. Julian was a baptized Christian. He was a Catholic, but he renounced Christ. He formally said, I hate Christ. He said this. And he said, I am going to return the Roman Empire to paganism. Roman paganism. We're going back to Zeus. We're going back to Athena. We're going back to Mercury. All the pagan gods, that's what's going to happen. He's restoring the Vestal Virgins and the idols and the shrines and the altars and the pagan sacrifices to the gods. So Christians had had legalization from 313 up to 361. And now they're seeing everything fall back into paganism. And if you were a Christian at this time, you would say to yourselves, oh no, this is the worst possible outcome for the Catholic Church. We had tax-free churches. We had legal status. We were able to be in the court of the emperor and so on and so forth. But all these privileges brought with it heresy. The son of Constantine, Constantius II, who gave all this money and all this prestige to the bishops in the church. He spoiled the bishops. And the price to pay was heresy, Arianism. They began to deny the divine constitution of the church. Peter said, when Christ said to Peter, who do men say I am? Peter said, you are Christ, son of the living God. The church began to deny this truth in the 300s, right after she got legalization. She began to corporately, with the majority of the bishops, say, Christ is not fully divine. He's a mega angel, a super angel, created. And in this moment, God allowed a moment of wrath, very short. Thanks be to God. It's only from three, November 361 to June 363. He allowed an apostate Christian who denied his baptism and denied Christ altogether to become Roman emperor. 
and he took away the tax exemptions for the churches. But he did something that turned the tide. Satan thought he won. Satan said, yes, I have the Roman Empire back into my claws. They're worshiping idols and doing blood sacrifice to demons. We have won Rome back. But Julian the Apostate knew that the Christians were divided over whether Christ was consubstantial with the Father or whether he was not consubstantial with the Father. And so Julian the Apostate brought all the exiled Orthodox Catholic bishops back into the empire. He revoked the exiles. And what did that do? It brought all the traditional and Orthodox bishops like Athanasius back into the debate. There was no Twitter and Facebook and YouTube back then. If the emperor exiled you outside the Roman Empire, you had no influence over the churches, over the lay people, over the cities and the monasteries. The Arians had full control over everything. And now, because of a pagan, evil, demonic, apostate Roman emperor, Julian the Apostate, the good guys were allowed to come back onto the stage. Who are we talking about here? Put this up on the screen here. I'm so much of a nerd, I made this chart. Here's what we're talking about. The very first one, St. Alexander, Pope St. Julius. I've already talked about St. Hoseus, uh, St. Dionysius of Milan. These are all the first wave Orthodox good Catholic theologians. St. Anthony of the Egypt supported the Trinity, consubstantial. Then we get into St. Hilary of Poitiers, St. Eusebius of Vercelli, St. Lucifer of Cagliari. He's an amazing guy. That name, don't let it fool you. St. Athanasius. He dies in 373. This, now that when we get into this era, we're getting into the second wave of the defenders of the Trinity. St. Basil the Great dies in 379. St. Paulinus, St. Gregory Nazianzus, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Ambrose of Milan, St. John Chrysostom, and it goes on from there. During this time, there was division and fighting amongst Christians. Public debates, schisms. Here's an interesting fact for you. In Antioch, St. Lucifer went there because Miletius, who was the bishop patriarch of Antioch, had been consecrated bishop by Arians. He, St. Lucifer was a follower of St. Athanasius. He went up there and consecrated a new bishop for Antioch, Paulinus. You had two, at the same time, patriarch bishops of Antioch. Paulinus was in communion with Rome. Miletius wasn't. Paulinus ordained to the priesthood St. Jerome. The successor of Miletius, I think it was Flavian, ordained St. John Chrysostom. This means St. John Chrysostom was ordained deacon and priest outside the communion of Rome. And yet St. John Chrysostom is a saint and a doctor of the church because later he came into communion with Rome. Very complicated time. There are divisions and it gets very sloppy. There's confusion. But what emerges from it in the late 370s and then in 381 is the Second Council of Constantinople where they define that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all three are consubstantial and co-eternal. And the Orthodox teaching prevails. But it started... To turn 359, every historian will tell you that's the high point of Arianism. In 361 is when Julian the Apostate takes over, and that's when the wave rises up for orthodoxy. That's the pivot point. So, what I want to suggest is if we are going to enter into a time of apostasy, Socialism, the church is losing their tax exemption, persecutions, exiles. It could be the moment that we're praying for. 
It might be that the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, will bring about the day of wrath, the day of persecution, and the day of exile. What did we see in the 300s? All the good bishops were exiled. They tried to silence them. The lay people had to go to underground masses. They couldn't just walk to the cathedral in Antioch or Constantinople because guess what? All the bishops of Constantinople at this time were heretics. They were Arians. You, may, you know the uh, Hagia Sophia, the beautiful big cathedral that was turned into a mosque in the 1400s? The original one, before that one was built, the original Hagia Sophia in Constantinople was built and dedicated and consecrated by Arians. The original. There's actually three buildings of the Hagia Sophia all in that same spot. The first one was originally dedicated as an Arian church. So can God use Julian the Apostate to fix the worst heresy in the history of the church until now? Yes. But it means that the good Catholics, the good Christians, might be tortured, might be martyred, might be put into exile, might be silenced and punished. Is that a price that we are willing to pay? The time periods parallel one another. In the early 300s, after 313, the Catholic Church had all kinds of privilege, money, fame, and she became corrupt and heretical until a moment of apostasy entered into the political scene. And we too, in the Catholic Church, have experienced decades of money, prestige, cardinals hobnobbing with the President of the United States, cardinals at the UN, cardinals at the EU, government money. Could it be that we are about to slam into a wall where everything that we've become accustomed to, that we think we just take it for granted, we're going to slam into a wall and wake up and realize that we can't go to church every Sunday, we can't receive the sacraments, getting baptized and getting confirmation, can't take that for granted anymore. Having church picnics and processions and feast days, it's all taken away from us. The government says in order to travel, to, in order to go to college, in order to get a marriage license, you have to have this vaccination or you're excluded, you're exiled. People said in the comments, I have the feeling Taylor's giving up on Trump. Shame on you. I never said that. Not giving up on Trump. And if Biden steals this whole thing, that's on the devil. That's on the thieves and the liars. But we have to realize God has a certain amount of patience. And God, if you read the Bible, and you should read the Bible every day, God, because of the sins of his people, hands them into the, to the hands of Pharaoh and the hands of the Assyrians and the hands of the Babylonians and the hands of the Medes and the Persians and into the hands of the Greeks and into the hands of the Romans. And again, in the time of the New Covenant in the church, the hands of the Persians who steal the cross from the Holy Sepulchre. Happens over and over again. Why? Because the people of God reject him and fall into heresy and moral laxity. This has nothing to do with giving up on Trump. It has to do with facing the reality that it might be that God in his providence has chosen to deliver us in our era the same way he did in the 300s. And that is, here you go. Here is an apostate ruler. 
Will you accept the exile and then the return? That's what God did. We can't for the next whatever happens. I don't know what's going to happen. And Trump could very well pull it off. I hope so. I hope so. But that doesn't mean that the questions of socialism, abortion, mandatory vaccines are going to go away. And it doesn't mean that the apostasy and the heresy that we see among certain bishops will magically go away. A time of reckoning is coming. It could happen sooner. It could happen later. But I think seeing apostasy in the church and in the political realm, as in Joe Biden, who's a fake Catholic, I've been saying it over and over, he's a fake, fake Catholic. You cannot support the murder of babies in the womb and say that you represent the Catholic Church. You just can't. It's impossible. And yet Joe Biden does. That's why I'm drawing the connection here between Julian the Apostate and Joe Biden. Now, the real question is, if this happens, what will we do? And I know the outcome. I know that in these moments, these crucible moments, God purifies and raises up beautiful and holy saints. There will be people who resist to death, resist to torture. There will be people who are inconvenienced. There will be people who are exiled. There are people who will lose their privileges, lose their wealth, lose their health for the sake of Christ. My guess is if you lived in the 350s and you were a Christian, you would have said, man, you know, I, in my heart, I know Jesus is consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father. But when I look around, all the bishops deny that. If you go to church in the cathedrals and in the churches and the parishes, all the bishops deny that. They tell me that Athanasius is a sinner, a heretic, and a schismatic. But then a moment happened where all of this, be the crucible moment happened. And all the good, holy, Orthodox and Catholic bishops came back into the empire. And they started debating. And the lay people rallied to them. And by the time you get to 381, there's a complete reversal in the church. Tradition and orthodoxy are restored in 381. Could that happen for us? Could the confusion after Vatican II, the heresies, the apostasies, the decline in mass attendance, the decline in belief in the real presence, could all of these things have a reversal as we enter into hard times? I think so. I think so. Will people have to suffer? I think so. That's always the price. So, could Biden still pull it off? I mean, could Trump still pull it off against Biden? I hope so. I truly hope so. But, if he doesn't, it could be the means that a gracious God uses to restore that which is good. It could be the means to save more souls. And if we think our current crisis as Catholics in 2020 parallels at all what went on in the 4th century, it seems that we are going to need an apostate political order to be the crucible to create the solution inside the Catholic Church amongst those who call themselves followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. That's how de that's how. The Father did it before, and that's how he could do it again. All right, that's it. Let's pray. Whatever happens, I did a show before, uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, whatever happens in the election, whatever happens in politics, our homework, our vocation doesn't change. You read the Bible every day. You study good theology every day. You catechize your children 
every day. You pray the rosary every day. You're not on the team. You read the Bible. You attend traditional Latin Mass. You rally to the bishops and the priests who are good. And those bishops and priests who are more like the Arians, compromising on faith and morals, we don't support them. We support the heroic, the good, those who honor the Lord Jesus Christ and their faith and their life and their morals. That's what we do. We have become a lazy, weak, effeminate church used to luxury and political favors and privilege. And it's created a church environment that we realize is not what God intends for us. And so we might have to accept. I think a lot of us want to, to sidestep that and say, well, God can just all fix it if, you know, a Vigano becomes Pope or something like that. Mm. Yeah, that'd be nice. That's not usually what God does to fix things. He asks for people to take up their cross. He asks for us to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. And how did Jesus Christ, our Lord, fix the ultimate problem? Original sin, sin and death? Death on a cross. But the death on the cross leads to the resurrection. All right, let's pray. If you like this video, give it a like. Please share and please subscribe. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et et mortis nostre. Amen. Almighty Father, the future looks complicated and dim. We ask that you would give your people faith, hope, and charity. We also ask that you would give us the graces of perseverance and a willingness to suffer for the holy name of Jesus Christ. We pray for your Catholic Church that you would purify it from the papacy all the way down to the local parish. And we ask if it's possible that you would please use us and make us humble in our service to you. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, friends, thanks for watching. Make sure you're praying that rosary every single day. If you don't pray the rosary, you are not on the team. It's a great sign to figure out who's praying the rosary. Find those people and be friends with them. Find fellowship with those people. There's a great realignment coming. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a great realignment coming, and there's going to be a shift. Not to something new, a shift to something that's traditional, a, a shift to something that's tried and true, the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church, not something that needs to be updated every five to ten years in its liturgy and its theology. We don't need to update our teaching on the death penalty. We don't need to update and recreate Eucharistic prayers. We don't need to update and recreate the liturgy for baptism. We already have it. Let's continue in that. People are waking up and they want tradition. So be on the team in all ways possible. All right. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless.